Praise the Lord. It's, it's great to belong to family, isn't it? There's a, there's a, I'm going to sh- share a thought sometime in my message this Sunday or next Sunday, Lord Terry's, about a, a little verse that's hidden away in the book of Psalms, verse 68, the 68th, 68th Psalm. It says, God puts the lonely in families. Think about that for a moment. God puts the lonely in families. How God understands the social aspect of our lives and how He puts children in the care of moms and dads and extended family. And that's the way it's supposed to work. When children are abandoned, they are at risk of incredible dysfunction in their lives. So thank God. That's the reason why we invest literally tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars each year, maybe close to $100,000 a year or more, uh, just in children's ministries, because your children are important to us. Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Acts. For a moment, I thought that our brother, our brother who read this morning was going to steal my text, but he read from the third chapter. I will be reading from the second chapter, just a few verses in a few moments. So the ambulance arrives, and when it does, they begin to do something. How many has ever had the experience of having to call an ambulance to your home? Let me just see. Oh, oh my goodness. I didn't realize that you were such an ambulatory congregation. <laughs> so, so the ambulance arrives, and the white jacket medical people come into your home, and they are just all over you. They're doing one thing in particular, and they are coming because there's been a call, there's been a need. And the first thing they do when they arrive at your place is check your vital signs. How many understand that we have what's called vital signs? And if they're missing, we're gone. That's basically what happens. And so before you know it, here's what's happening. You're speeding across the city accompanied by sirens and fast-moving ambulances. Now, you've never traveled across the city of that, that before, maybe once when the police stop you for driving through a school zone much faster than you intended to. But you arrive at the hospital, and then they take you to the emergency department, and you are immediately placed into a very special care facility. How many nurses or medical people do we have in this audience this morning? I know we have quite a few, but uh, some of you are on shift work. You You know what I'm talking about. And so the first thing they do, this wonderful medical team at the, at the hospital emergency center, is that they, they are caregivers and they start monitoring what's called the vital signs. They get the quick report from the ambulance drivers and the medics on the ambulance, and so they begin to check everything. I've been there. I know what that's like. They check your heart rate. They check your blood pressure. They check your breathing patterns. They check your eyes because the eyes are windows to the body in in, in so many ways that we don't quite understand. They check your temperature. They want to make sure that they know what's going on with you for one reason, so that they can help you back to a healthy body and a healthy life. I know sometimes uh, it seems a little intrusive when strangers begin to poke and prod where they should not be poking and prodding. But you see, all of that is thrown to one side because the vital signs need to be checked in order to make sure that this patient is going to make it. In order for them to make sure this patient, they know what's wrong with this patient, and the vital signs give them good indications of what's happening in the whole body as a complex unity. Sister Doris, my fine nurse down here is smiling. I hope I get it right, Doris. And so there's an analysis done, and they decide on what, based on what they discover what to do about this person that was brought to the hospital for help because they checked the vital signs of the body. Don't you find it interesting that the church 
is referred to consistently in the Bible as the body of Christ. Think about it for a moment. I begin to flag some of the, some of the particular places where it was used in the Word of God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. Listen to what it says about the body, the church of Christ. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. One body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. Then in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, For we being many are one bread and one body. Think about it. There are five or six hundred individuals here this morning, but there's only one body. How can that be, Pastor? Because we are the body of Christ. There is only one body, the 17th verse says. For we are all partakers of that one bread, and that bread is Christ. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just a couple of chapters over, in the 27th verse, we have Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he's using the same language again. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. We don't lose our identity when we come into the body of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ, and we're members in particular. Some may serve as arms, some as legs, some as ears, some as ears, some as toes, but we're all part of the body. We're all part of the body. Let me just give you a couple more references. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, you will find a, a, a reference there to... Um, to the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses two and 22 and 23. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And then finally, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, you find this another reference. And I'm, I'm just pushing the issue a little bit this morning on this idea of body so that we can get a full glimpse of how the Scriptures see us as the body of Christ. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, we have these statements made by Paul. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are the body. We are the body. So it's very interesting to, to understand that the church is the body of Christ, not bodies, but body. We have today, as I speak, literally hundreds of millions of brothers and sisters in Christ. We have them that speak every language basically under the sun, and they are every color under the sun, and they are every culture under the sun. And that's what makes it so unique when you travel and you encounter different church groups and you encounter different um, cultures and you realize that we may be on earth uh, separated by culture and language, but in the eyes of the Lord, we are one body. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church, the body of Christ. It's an amazing, amazing truth as, as we think about it. It's the body of Christ. But how often do we hear this phrase, how's church going? Well, I don't know. We put it on a good solid foundation. It's still on the corner of Countryside and Bramalee. That's not what they meant. It's interesting how we use the language sometimes. See, this is the building where the church meets. This is not the church. Oh, I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I know, but I'm just getting you to think about the truth that the church is not the building, the church is the body of Christ, the church is believers. You and I are the church. We're not confined by, 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 by a building, we are the church of God. And so we sometimes ask the question, like, how's church going? We all kind of know what that means, or what's happening at church, or 
anything new at church. These questions sometimes come at us, and we, we try at a moment to explain them, and we try to give our understanding of it because we know what the, the, the question is, means. But we could receive a whole number of answers when we hear that question being asked, a whole number of answers. Let me give you a sample. Well, you see, if you're from my culture in Newfoundland, you would say, not much, boy. <laughs> or you say, over the top, my son. Or it could be another remark. Ah, oh, not much. Same old crowd. Same old sermons. Might be time for a change, you know. These are the kind of responses you get sometimes. And same old, same old. You get that resp response sometimes. I, I, I had the privilege to know and pastor a, um, another retired pastor who became a good friend of mine, a lady pastor. And she told me this story, and as I was preparing my message, I couldn't help but smile at that, this part of my message. She, her and her husband passed in an assembly where they really got into seeking the face of God for revival. And God, in His grace, began to bring revival. Souls were being saved. People filled with the Holy Ghost. The town was being shaken. Well, there was another church in town that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, didn't believe in uh, uh, the Holy Ghost as we Pentecostals believe. And their church began to, their, 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 their members began to leave and go to this Pentecostal church where, where everything was alive and everything was happening. And she told us that the pastor of that other church called his board of directors together and his leaders in the church, and they wondered what, what should they do? How could they stem the tide of people leaving their church for the church across the street where the fire of the Holy Ghost was burning? And there was a number of suggestions made, of course. And one good brother thought, maybe if they change the big drum in the church, they might get more people coming. How are things going? Maybe we need a change. Sometimes we look at these sort of things and we wonder what's happening. What is happening in the church? What's going on in the church? What's taking place? And the list of why and how things are being perceived as going on in the church goes on and on and on. So I want to ask the question this morning. What are the vital signs of a healthy church, the body of Christ? Is it a new drum being purchased? Is it a larger building being built? Is it soft padded seats being installed? Is it another sound system? Is it the lighting? What, what, what are the vital signs of a healthy church? How many understand this, that uh, some of the most beautiful people I've seen have been laid out in the funeral home? I've had a lot of funerals in my life, and I've dealt with death quite a bit, and I tell you, folks, there's times people have died, and I got the word and went with the family and ministered to them, and then later on met them at the funeral home, didn't recognize their loved one. After the undertaker was finished, they looked beautiful, wrinkle-free, had a smile on their face. I never saw a smile with their living. That's the point I'm trying to make. You can have a beautiful corpse, but it's still a corpse. You can have a beautiful body, but it still might be a corpse. I believe that what God has called the church to be is not a beautiful corpse, but a living, vibrant body of Christ doing what God wants us to do. Amen? And so I want to talk to you about the vital signs of a healthy church. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, Wyman I thought was going to steal my text, but he went on to, ver to chapter 3, which I appreciate so much. Acts chapter 2, let's read down from the 37th verse, shall we, to the 47th verse, just 11 verses there. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. 
Now, when they heard this, referring to Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, and Peter was explaining what God was doing as folk were being, speaking in tongues, and the Holy Ghost came, and, and, and Peter began to preach. Now, as they, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children, unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this terrible, sinful, untoward generation. Then they that, then they that gladly received Peter's word were baptized, baptized in water. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. As I read this particular passage of Scripture, I see six vital signs that indicates the healthy condition or lack thereof, of the local church, of the church of God, of the body of Christ. And so, as we read this, we find these signs, and I believe God is calling us as a congregation, and we are the congregation as individual members, and He's calling us to check our own lives personally, and then to check the temperature of what is happening in the house of God so that God might be glorified and His body, the church, might be producing for the reason that He saved us. How many understand that? That God's purpose in saving us was not just to get us to heaven. His purpose in saving us was to be His body on earth to bring others to Christ and get them to heaven. That's why we are saved. That's why we were redeemed. And God gives us abilities and giftings that are different from each other. But God has always provided something in every individual that's been truly born again that he can use by the work of the Holy Spirit so that he might or she might be able to share his, their faith with Christ and they might tell others about the good news of salvation. Amen. That's the purpose of the body. That's the whole purpose of the body. And so we're going to look at six things over the next Sunday or so as to what makes a church healthy. How many want their church body to be healthy? Come on, folks. How many want the church body to be healthy? How many are just contented with coming Sunday after Sunday, having a good worship service, having a good message, having a good altar call, and then going home with nothing happening? You shouldn't be if you are. There is constantly the desire within us to see God work and move in our lives. The first vital sign that I see in this set of verses here in second chapter of Acts is, that, is this, this particular sign. God-fearing, God-focused, and God-honoring preaching and teaching. If you will look closely at the 37th to 40th verse, you will, will see this there when Peter stands up and begins to preach the Word of God. Pastors, we are God's pastors to our congregation, to His congregation at this time, and God wants us to be God-fearing, God-focused, and God-honoring, and our preaching to be the same. I travel sometimes, and I hear some really strange preaching. I know where it comes from. It doesn't come from the Word of God. It comes out of the latest books or the latest magazines or the style of Hollywood. Pastors, we are called 
to be immersed in the Word of God. We are called to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We are called to bring our, our personality and our personal uh, way of expressing ourselves into the work of God so that God can use that for His glory and honor. You have five, six pastoral uh, pastors on your staff. Every one of us are different. But the reason why God has blessed us so far is because we have a heart for God. Our heart is singularly for God. We express ourselves in different ways and different means, depending on our background, depending on our, 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 our philosophy of life, depending on a number of things. But at the core of everything is that the Word of God is the Word of God. And the Word of God is the only thing that's worthy to be preached in the pulpit. The only thing that's worthy to be preached in the pulpit. See, churches grow in purity and holiness through God honoring preachers. Preach, congregations grow in, 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 in purity and holiness. So I, I want you to know something. I, I've encountered uh, uh, the opposite, and it's not a good sight. God calls us as pastors to lead God's people into a right understanding of who God is. God is not my buddy in heaven. He is God the Creator. He's Almighty. Yes, I know we sing, uh, He is a friend of, I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. The truth is, that has, has really need to be stretched to be true. That really has to be stretched. God is, God is friendly towards us. But sometimes we treat our friends, sometimes even with less honor than we treat our strangers. God is holy. God inhabits eternity. God is greater than anything we could imagine ever it could be. When we think we've imagined all that we've read in this Word, there's still a dimension of God that you and I can't comprehend. So I get a little uneasy when I hear teaching and preaching about bringing God down to my level. That's not what God intended. God wants us to understand His Word, move moved by the Spirit, and lift us up and raise us up in that atmosphere of awe and wonder that God would call us to declare the Word of God. So I believe that the very first thing, if a church is going to have the vital signs of, 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 of being the body of Christ, I think she's got to be led by pastors in every area that fear the Lord, love God, honor His Word, and honor what the privilege He has given us to go. Pastor, that's good pastoral theology. That's good pastoral theology. And pastor, I call us as a group today to walk in holiness and purity before God so that we might honor God in all things. It is our chief responsibility to God through our preaching and teaching His Word that we bring His people into a place where they honor God and love God no matter where they come from, but they encounter God through the ministry leadership in the local assembly. Remember, there is no new thing under the sun. Oh, today, this, amongst pastors, there is so much desire for what's new, what's happening, what's happening down here, what's happening over there, what's happening somewhere else, fed air, fed there, fed, fed somewhere else. Listen, folks, I, I'm all open to better ways of doing things, but it all must be browned up and centered in the Word of God, Amen. not the thoughts of men. Not the thoughts of, we have religious preachers, and, and, and they have made millions and millions and millions of dollars on some idea they had, put it in a book, and gullible people bought it, and made the preacher a millionaire, and he went on and lived like a millionaire. Don't put your money into anybody you don't know. That's a good policy, isn't it? Don't run for every fad. Know what you are buying. Know what you're listening to. Check it out with the Word of God. God's Word is the complete revelation of what we need for our day. God's Word is the complete revelation of what we need for today. And the moment you see a new revelation, beware. Beware. Check it out with the Word of God. The Word of God is always relevant and is always applicable. What the Word of God said to 100 years ago, it says today. How the Word of God affected our cultures 100 years ago is the same power to affect our cultures today. You see, if we're going to do any running around at all, it must be to the Word of God. It must be to the Word of God. Does he or she preach the Word of God? Does he or she teach the Word of God? 
I believe in the day of, of media and, and television and all this kind of stuff that goes on. I believe we are all in, bombarded by things. My first, uh, my first advice to that is check it out against the Word of God. Check it out against the Word of God. The Word of God comes in different, different versions, that's good. The Word of God comes in different sizes, that's good. In fact, some of you know I, I exaggerate a little bit sometimes, and, you, and I made a statement a couple of Sundays ago about having one of the smallest Bibles in the world. And I know you laughed at me. So I thought I'd prove to you this morning, this is the, one of the smallest Bibles in the world. It is the complete Word of God from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. And for those who have bad eyesight, it came with a magnifying glass. <laughs> Seriously, it did. It did. I, we're not sure. A friend of mine gave this to me many years ago who was fascinated with the Word of God. And we're not sure how old it is, but it could date back to King George III. Or, 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 or uh, I made a couple of notes inside of this thing. It, it could have back to uh, William IV. Or, or the son of George the Third. We're not quite sure, but a long ways down go. And so I just want to prove to you that sometimes my exaggeration and my exaggeration is truth. <laughs> right here. This is the whole word, the complete word of God, right there. I'm going to take it on with me. I just want to prove it to you, that's all. His word has and is the final say. That's his word. We're going to be judged from the word of God. So pastors, a healthy church begins with people led by pastors who preach the Word of God. And I have wonderful preachers on my staff. Any, any of those pastors on my staff could step into any pulpit and preach a good, solid Word of God and bless people. And so, pastors, I, I commend you for that. I commend you for that. I commend you for that. And, 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 and may God's blessing continue upon your lives, upon your ministries, no matter what happens in the next 25 or 30 years should Jesus tarry. So if you're going to have a healthy church, you need to have pastors who preach the Word of God solidly and firmly. The second ingredient in a, in a, in a, a vital ingredient in, in a healthy church is discipleship. Discipleship. Churches grow deep through discipleship. They grow in holiness through God-fearing preaching, right? Secondly, they grow deeper through discipleship. Listen to, the, to Acts chapter 42, 2, verse 42 and the first part. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What does the word disciple mean? I, I've heard that word since the time I was a boy, and especially when I became a Christian at the age of 20, 22, I heard that word disciple. What does it mean? Well, the very short message or the very same short way of, 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 of defining it will be in two steps. Number one, it is one who accepts. That's the first step. And the second step is one who assists in speaking and spreading the doctrine of another. A disciple is one who, who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another. So if we're disciples of Jesus, we are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're telling people about the things of God. We are uh, confronting people, or we respond to people that confront us with the truth about God's Word. And so as disciples of Christ, we are called to make disciples or followers through teaching. Matthew 28 and 20. Just come with me for a few moments, please, to Matthew 28 and 20. This is, this is the Word of God. 28 and 20. It simply, it simply is the words of Jesus. 28 and 20. Jesus is going away. And he says to his disciples in the 19th, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them... To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I believe that the first step after salvation and the first step after God fearing, having God fearing leadership in the church growth life is that there would be a, 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 a commitment to discipleship. Discipleship. A disciple of Christ is one who called to make disciples, to teach. 
It refers to the doctrine of Christ, which is the Bible. This is Jesus fulfilled the Word of God. Jesus fulfilled the Word of God. Now, now at that time, all he had was the Old Testament. But as, the, as God's revelation unfolded into the New, you saw where Jesus fulfilled both the Old and New Testaments. He, he, this is his doctrine. This is his truth. There is no other. He is the, he, this is the Word. He, is the, he was the Word in flesh. Amen. And he dwelt amongst us. And so we are to teach the Word of God. We're to understand what the Word of God says. Unfortunately, unfortunately, many think that the moment of salvation is the moment where everything began and everything ends. And the truth is, it's simply the place where everything begins. It really is. It really is. It's the key to accomplishing what God wants done. Acts 2 and 42 says they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine was a process of discipleship. They taught it, they learned it, and then they taught it to others. That's what we must become. We must become disciples of Jesus Christ. So next Sunday night, we're going to be, be strategic in beginning a discipleship ministry during our evening services. That it's, our evening services are going to be vibrant. They're going to be very much the same as they've always been. I'm just hoping that we're going to have three, 400 people coming out because every one of us need to be discipled to be discipled if we're going to be fully effective for the kingdom work of God. A discipleship program. We're going to be teaching and preaching on one of the single most instructions that Jesus gave us when he went away. When he went away, we read it in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. He said, teach and preach and teach again to observe. Sometimes we do a good job at preaching, but we do a very poor job at teaching. Because we have put the greatest emphasis on preaching. And we have preached to people, and they have heard us preach, and then after a while they just get at a certain level in their Christian understanding and never get beyond that. Because we have not taught the heart or the discipline of discipleship. One who learns and then tells the doctrines of another, and in this case, Jesus Christ. So we need to understand this truth. We are going to preserve the, the beauty of our Sunday evening services by having a worship time, receiving offering, sharing the discipleship model. The next Sunday night, we'll have a communion service after that sharing. Other nights, we're going to have application of that sharing. We're going to have prayer together. We're going to begin to understand that we need to know more about who we are in Christ so, so that we can answer those who ask us what's going on. See, it's, it, under, it, it, it seems to me, as I hear the words of Jesus before he went away, it seems to me that the discipleship was and is Jesus' greatest priority after salvation. And, 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 and um, Jesus was teaching about that, and he said that the, the, the seed was sown, and it was never taken care of, and then the birds came and destroyed it. I believe that's the way it is. A lot of people get saved. They're not discipled, they're not cared for in, in, in a strategic way, and they just lose their bearings, and they just lose it with God. I, I, think, I think the very first thing when a new baby is born, as we saw this morning, it is surrounded by loving parents and loving family, and it's cleaned up, and it's given back to them by the doctors, and they bring it home, and they bring this child home, and they, they nurse this baby, they care for this baby, they check on this baby every one hour, and every little stir, they're out to the room where the baby is, right, Brother Andrew, just to be sure that everything is okay with the baby. Well, when people get saved, they're babies. And they need the care of a church that can teach them and care for them and nurture them and, and bring them to wholeness in Christ. That's discipleship. Because you know what's going to happen down the road somewhere. They're going to be asked something, and they won't have an answer. They'll realize all I done was got saved. And God wants us to be schooled in the teachings of his word. Can be schooled. See, some, we, by, by nature, us as Pentecostals are emotional people. Now, I don't, I'm not an emotional person, as you know. And, 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 and we get all caught up with emotion. Oh, it was a great service. Sister so-and-so danced all around the church. 
That's wonderful for Sister So-and-so. But does Sister So-and-so know how to explain what happened to her if someone says to you, what happened to you last night? I was sitting in your church. I'm not saved. Don't belong to your church. What happened to you last night? Oh, the Holy Ghost was on me. And if that's all she knows, she's lost a great opportunity to introduce someone to Christ. That's my point. And we need to become soul winners. And, and, and unless you're a disciple first, you can't be a soul winner. The other thing that happens is when we, when we gather just some bare bones truth, that's all that we receive. And if the preaching and the singing don't contain those bare bones truth, we, it's not a good service. And we wonder, what's happening to the preachers? What's happening to the church? Folks, that's not the question. The question should be, what's happening to me? How, how, how well do I know what I've received? How well do, can, I, can I lead my neighbor to Christ? How well can I answer the questions of, of those that the Lord brings into my life? That's discipleship. That's discipleship. I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning. See, we cannot be the vibrant, life-filled body that Jesus intends for us to be if we do not follow through on discipleship. Because what will happen, one of two things, you'll have what's called a revolving door. People will come because they, 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 they hear good things and, 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 and they're not discipled and they just leave again. Or they come and get saved and stay at that level and really they become uh, inadequate to do what God wants them to do. And God has so much more for us. Look, folks, sharing our faith sometimes, yeah, it's a stretch even for pastors. Sharing our faith sometimes in an impromptu way is sometimes a little challenging. But I tell you what, there is nothing more rewarding than having a conversation with someone who's open about what you do and who you are and to watch their face change and to watch their hearts uh, pump and to watch their expression change uh, as you begin to share with them the, your living faith in Christ. You talk about the cross. You talk about sin. You talk about the joy of the Lord. You talk about peace. You talk about all of those things. And because you're experienced in talking about it, they're absorbing it. I've seen it so many times. And you know that what you're sharing is backed up by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the whole idea of being discipled and discipling somebody. See, we will remain in our infancy unless we follow the biblical pattern of salvation and then discipleship. Now, everybody rejoices when a little baby is born. We saw three beautiful little babies this morning, two brand new and one one year old. Don't worry, he's still got 69 years warranty on him. But if next year this time, Brother Andrew came to the church with the baby and she hasn't grown, there'd be some sadness, wouldn't there? There'd be some questions, what's, what's wrong? And Brother Andrew says, nothing. I say, but Brother Andrew, a year ago, I dedicated your daughter. She, she hasn't grown. Oh, don't worry about that. That somewhere down the road she'll start growing. We'd all say, huh? As believers, newborn believers, we need to grow in Christ. The best program, the best means that God has given us to grow people is what? Discipleship. It is an intentional, intentional, intentional decision to disciple and be discipled. Discipleship. Discipleship. Oh, but pastor, if we're doing discipleship Sunday night, that means there's no preaching? How do I say this? You know it's pretty important when I stop. It might not be preaching, depending on how you perceive it. But it will be teaching. And Jesus said in my text, go and make this and teach, and teach, and teach. Oh, but pastor, we'd rather have someone running around, stomping around, spitting. You don't need people to run around, stomp around, and spit. You, that's good. That's good sometimes. And I can provide you with one like that. 
But we also need intentional biblical teaching that fulfills our mandate from the Lord to disciple people. And so we're going to be doing a disciple. Every one of you that's here this morning need to be out to our discipleship classes. Every one of you. When you say, well, Pastor, I've been through a whole bunch of stuff. That's good. Come on and share your experience with us. We appreciate your background. How many has never done, in this audience this morning of 500, 600 plus, how many has never done a strategic discipleship program? Let me see your hands. Look at this. Absolutely. We're going to provide that because we believe that's what God's desire is. You see, folks, listen here. Let's share a little insight with you. God's placed us in a little neighborhood where there are some things unfolding. Many cultures, and, and you know what's happening? God is opening doors for, the, for you and I, the body of Christ, to connect with those cultures. These cultures are, gonna be, are, are already being stirred. And God is looking for a people that has been discipled so that we be, can become evangelists to our neighborhood. Every one of us can become an evangelist to the person that, where we work, to the neighborhood where we live, to the neighborhood where we worship, all of these areas, because there's such a wonderful work of God going on in bringing people, and we're going to go, and we're going to be discipled so we can explain to them. Why are you saved? Because if you're not saved, I'm going to go to hell. Well, that, that's a good motivation. There's no doubt about that. But it, it must have a greater impact than just a raw statement like that. Discipleship. Discipleship. The New Testament church was all about preaching and discipleship. Every believer, young and old, newly saved, long time a Christian, it is imperative that we understand and engage in discipleship, both its training, its lifestyle, and its testimony. The New Testament is about discipling, able to give an answer for what we believe. Able to give an answer for what we believe. This is the best accomplished through a focused and intentional teaching and learning. It will change your life. It will change the lives of others. Listen to the subjects that we're going to be teaching over the next few Sunday nights as the Lord tarries. We're going to do it in a strategic way. We're going to do a four, uh, each, each, one of these, each one of these topics of 12 topics as four Segments. Then we're going to take a little break for a, a Sunday night or two and just do our, 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 our regular Sunday night type service just to give us a break away. We're going to talk about knowing God. So I say to you, do you know God? You say, of course you know, I know God. I've been saved for 20 years. Then we begin to talk about the attributes of God and, and say, how do you factor that in to the God that you know? And you say, oh, I never heard that before. I, I just know God. Because, you see, people are going to be asking questions, and we need to be able to get an answer. We're going to talk about being called to be a discipleship. We're going to talk about the grace of God. The grace of God. Now, folks, I'm Pentecostal. Born into Pentecostal faith. Born again into the Pentecostal faith. Preached the Pentecostal faith. I know about the grace of God. But there are still Pentecostal people who, who can't get past that, that, that idea of God chopping our heads off the first time we stumble because they've never understood, the, understood repentance and the grace of God. I grew up in a culture where certain things were sin. We put the tag sin on it, and if someone did it, they were fell back. But we put our blessing on backbiting and, and blasphemy and, and, and talking about others and destroying character. Oh, that was all right. Come on, folks. You may be bleeding a little bit, but shout amen. amen. We, 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 we established our own limit for sin, and we put our own approval on certain kinds of sins that we had. Isn't that true? You know the reason why? Because we don't really understand what sin is. We're going to talk about that. The grace of God. Look, folks, my spirit is stirred because people have been driven out of church because other godly people who have never been discipled condemned them for something less than they were doing. That's right. That's right. It happened back there. 
It's happening today. We need to understand the grace of God. We're going to talk about the cross, sin, and repentance. What is the, what, what, what was the, what is the work of the cross? What, what is the nature of sin? What is the meaning of repentance? Oh, I know you can go to my old friend Webster and find his explanation for it. But what, is, what, is, what does it mean to repent? What does it mean to hear the voice of God? What does it mean to hear the voice of God? We're going to talk about that for four Sunday nights. What, is it, what does it mean for the disciples to be disciplined? We understand, how do we understand this truth that as the disciples of Christ, we must represent Christ in so many ways? What does it mean when Paul says, oh, it's, 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 it's permissible to me, but it's not proper? What does that mean? We're going we're to study that. We're going to talk about relationships. Relationships in the spirit, relationships in, in, our, physical, in, in our physical being. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. We, we, you know, we sometimes grab a plaque, go out and protest something that we don't like, and we call it spiritual warfare. We need to be careful. Spiritual warfare happens in the spirit. And if we're not spiritually prepared for spiritual warfare, we're going to get laughed at. I could give you some incredible, incredible stories of true spiritual warfare. We'll, we'll get into them somewhere along the way. We're going to talk about the church in the book of Acts as our pattern. We're going to understand what the New Testament church looked like that the Holy Spirit visited and filled mightily with His power. And, and within a hundred years had, had invaded the mighty Roman Empire. We're going to talk about advancing the kingdom, the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about purpose, passion, and giftedness. We're going to talk about why we're, the purpose we are saved. We're going to talk about the passions that we have for the things of God. We're going to talk about the giftings that God has given us. There are some of you here this morning that are sitting here, you got giftings, uh, and because they have not been brought out and, 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 and nurtured, uh, we're all worse off for it because you should be sharing that gifting. You see... For some, Christianity is coming to church and sitting in a pew once a Sunday or a couple times a week, and then that's good, we wait the next Sunday. That is the farthest from the truth on what Christianity is. Christianity is not an action within me, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. We don't come to the house of God to get a Geritol fix because we're tired. We come because it's who we are. We come to worship. We come to build each other up. And we go out with a fresh zeal to take on the world. Equipped with the knowledge of the Word of God. That's what discipleship is. That's what it's all about. We're going to talk about mentoring and making disciples. Exciting. Look. We're providing a book that costs us $20, and we're only going to charge 10 for it. Understand, nothing is free. So you're going to get a $20 value for $10, and then you're going to learn things that's going to change your life. You say, but Pastor, I'm, I'm 60 years old. It's about time you got changed. It's about time you got changed. Everybody needs you change at age 60. We want you to pick up your copy. Are they available at the, rece at the reception desk? Make up your mind you're going to be part of what God is doing. Or you can just decide to sit where you are and let Christianity and Christ and the, and, and the excitement of serving the Lord with purpose go right on by. There's something here for every person of both genders, of all ages, and every culture for us to, to engage so that we can be part of the vital life of this church that God wants to use in a powerful way in all that we do. All of these disciplines in the context of a God-fearing church with the presence and anointing of the Holy Spirit is the recipe for spiritual growth, renewal, and evangelism. Let me say it to you again. All of these 12 disciplines... 
in the context of a God-fearing church with the presence and anointing of the Holy Spirit is the re recipe for spiritual growth, renewal, and evangelism. I got one more point before I close. But a bit, it's a bit of a long point, so don't sigh. The third, the third vital sign of a church, of a body that's alive and accomplishing what God wants done, is not only the God-fearing preaching, it's not only the discipleship training, but it's worship. You say, Pastor, you, you, shouldn't you have said worship before discipleship? No. No, discipleship becomes one of the highest acts of worship. Discipleship becomes one of the highest acts of worship. Well, what's worship, Pastor? Well, worship is coming to church Sunday morning, singing a song, putting your hands up, saying amen, going home. No, God called us to a lifestyle of worship. Everything we do as children of God should be done in the atmosphere of worship. God says to you, you see a neighbor over there struggling with his snowblower and a lot of snow in his driveway and his snowblower broke down. You need to do something about that. You say, Lord, you know I'm busy. Lord, the golf game is on and I've got to go inside and watch the golf. Got to go pick up the groceries. Got to do that. How about if we realize suddenly that that act of helping a neighbor becomes an act of worship? Think about it. Think about it. Every time we engage someone that don't know anything about Christ and we do it out of, out of, as unto the Lord, it's an act of worship. Lord, I'd rather be doing something else right now, but Lord, this opportunity is an opportunity to worship you by sharing who I am through this good deed. When you stop on a highway to help someone, you do it even though it's raining and you don't feel like it. You do it as an act of worship. Worship, you see, here's where we got mixed up a little way back. We think worship is in church with good music and good singing and our hands up. That is worship. But that's only the entrance to worship. That's only the entrance. Do you know the reason why we're doing all that? Because it feels good. If the song leader sounds like a crow instead of a nightingale, if the musicians sound totally out of fix, we probably wouldn't have our hands up and our eyes closed singing. We'd be looking at each other. What's wrong with that crowd up there this morning? Doesn't make any difference. If you came to worship, you came to worship. Folk, I'm serious. I am serious. Well, you know, Pastor, I couldn't worship because they were all out of tune and she squawked like a hen and, and he, 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 he sounded like a dog. So I just couldn't take it, Pastor. I just sat there with my arms folded. I've seen people with their arms folded and the glory of God's been coming down and they just, they're just out of sorts with what God is doing. That's not worship. Worship is saying, Lord, I don't care what happens today. I've come to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <laughs> Father, while they're fixing the sound system, I'm worshiping. I'm not looking back at them Cut out that foolishness, folks. Cut out that foolishness. Everything got to be just right. Well, the temperature was 67, and I'm used to 72 in my home. Oh, it was wonderful hot there this morning, Pastor. It must have been 80 degrees. I couldn't worship. Come on. If your worship is that shallow, you're not worshiping anyways. You're just here for a good time. You're just here because it's Sunday morning. I'm just, I'm wanting you to love me. But I want God's approval first. <laughs> Worship. The scripture is clearly clear in Acts 2 and 47. Listen to that, Acts 2 and 47. Just love it. I'm going to find Acts chapter 2 in a few minutes.
praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as they were praising God. They were in worship. They were in worship. They were praising God. So churches grow stronger through worship. They grow stronger through worship. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church. You see, that is solid and meaningful growth. When the Lord adds to the church. And when we get our focus right, when we get our worship right, when we get our surrender right, when we get our priorities right, God will add to the church and unto Him be glory. As daily people come to be saved and to know the power of God. That's what this is all about. You see, God ordained, directed, and, 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 and sincere worship is not about us feeling good. Oh, I know. Or liking a particular type of songs, lyrics, or music. It's about the unchangeable one, no matter what goes on in our lives. Hmm. Ask Job. Job chapter 1, verse 20, after he, had, after he had received all the calamities. And the only thing he had left was the last thing he needed, his wife. Read it. He lost everything except his wife. And his wife said, Job, curse God and die. Who needs that? After everything was gone, except his wife, what did he do? He sat down and worshipped. That's right, folks. He sat down and worshipped. How about Abraham? God said, take your son. And then he rubbed it in a little bit. Your only son. Read it. And take him to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham took Isaac from a three days journey. got close to the mountain. Said to his servants, you hold up here for a day or so. The lad and I are going up To do what? Worship. You think Abraham was in his glee after waiting all those years to get a son? And now he's going to sacrifice him? And Abraham said, I'm going to go up and worship. You understand that that's the first time the word worship is used in the, in the complete Bible? There is a theological principle called first mention, and, and it usually says the first time a concept is mentioned, that context, that context governs so many other places, maybe every place where is mentioned later on. In layman's terms, that's what it means. Abraham said, I'm going to go up and work, we are going to go up and worship, and we're going to come back again. So was he feeling like worshiping? No. You see, worship is not a feeling. Worship is a, a realization of who God is. And who He is doesn't depend upon my circumstances. We're going to learn about worship. You know, Pastor, I couldn't worship. No, I just couldn't worship, sir. That person sitting next to me was looking through a book. The crowd behind me was chewing gum. The crowd in front of me was laughing and carrying on. Pastor, I couldn't worship. Well, a suggestion and an instruction. The suggestion is move. Get up where people are worshiping. And the instruction is forget about what's going on around you and worship between you and God. Uh -huh. Worship. 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 God ordained and directed and sincere worship is not about us feeling good or liking a particular type of songs, lyrics, or music. It's about Him, the unchangeable one, no matter what's going on in our lives. No matter what's going on in our lives. How often we hear, I didn't get much out of that because too fast, too slow, too new, too loud, too old, and the list goes on. Well, see, it wasn't for you to get something out of. It was for him. Think about it. 
It was for him. We have folk leaving our services who look like they sucked on pickles all the while they were in church. There's not a smile on their face. They're angry with everything they come across because they didn't enjoy the worship. As if they were the object of worship. There's only one object of worship here in this house. It's your Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Hallelujah. Someone give him praise. As leaders, we want to be sensitive. But first of all, we got to understand that our highest aim is today, Lord, in our coming together, we glorify your name. We make people who don't know you hunger to know you. We make people who don't know you well more thirsty to know you because of the worship that ascends unto you, for you alone are worthy. It's not about the heat being on. It's not about this and that and the person sitting alongside of you having wore deodorant or no deodorant. It's not about that. It's about worship unto the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's what it's about. The unchangeable one. Worship's first priority, I'm closing if the musicians like to come back. Worship's first priority is not for us to get something out of it. It's our expression to God for his love and grace. It is for God to get something out of it. Basically, our sacrifice of praise to him. Let me give you a little picture in my mind of what it looks like. In heaven, on a Sunday morning, on earth, at Pio Pentecostal Tabernacle. The church gathers, and we've come to worship Him. The music starts, people stand, we celebrate with song, fast numbers like we did this morning, our salvation in Christ, our our joy of being set free, the one who is awesome and the one who is mighty and the one who is glorious. And then we reflect a little bit, maybe some slower numbers, we reflect on what he's done in our lives. And the place is, place is filled with music and singing as God's people are worshiping the Lord. Let me take you to heaven for a few moments. I believe God, I believe God then signals to the angels. And I don't know if you can, up in heaven, if you can walk out and look over heaven at earth. I don't know how it all works, but I'm going to use my imagination a little bit. And so God is being worshipped by his, his church. Not a perfect church. Not a, not, not a church that is, 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 is 100% holy. Not a church, but they're working towards, by his grace, being ready for the coming of the Lord. And God is being worshipped. And God says to the angels, come with me. And God steps out to the balcony of glory. And he looks down and he says to the angels, See, see, this is my people. And listen to what they're singing. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, I'm redeemed. His child and forever The angel says, what does that mean? What does redeem mean? They don't know what it means. Because they've never been redeemed. Ha! Somebody say amen. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. And we sing about being saved. We sing about being saved. And the angels look at the Father and say, What does that mean? Father says to him, you can't understand. You can't understand. And they behold the praise and the worship that comes from the fallen nation who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. (laughs) And the angels fold their wings and say, we thought we had it all together. We didn't know what it was like to have fallen and need redemption. But we have been saved, amen. We have been set free. And the Lord God said, that's my body. That's the church, amen. Woo! That's the church in worship. Ah, would you stand and praise him, amen. Hallelujah. Sing it, redeem, pastor. Sing it, guys. Come on, amen. Let the angels wonder this morning. Why? Because we are redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. We're in worship. We're in worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We deep by the blood of
last verse. I know I should The King in whose love I delight, who lovingly guarded my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. See, sometimes, sometimes we, we get this whole idea that worship is about us. I understand that. I understand that. But a long, long time ago, I learned that that is not truth. And I want to share it with you as a congregation. Worship is not about us. Worship is about Him. With all of our shortcomings, faults, and failures, the angels look down and say, we don't know what they're talking about. The Father looks over at them and says, No, you can't know. You were never fallen. You were never redeemed. The angel says, Well, why isn't that one worshiping? The Father says, That one have lost sight of the priority. That one have, 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 have begun to think that worship is about them and their comfort and their everything going their way. But what about the other crowd that's singing? The Father says, they are learning that worship is about Him, and not them. Folk, if you just stop and think for a moment, the power of those words you're just saying is child and forever I am. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Not with silver or gold, not with things that will lose their value, but with the blood of the Lamb. Ha! Huh. How is it we can't worship? We're going to learn about worship in our establishment program. We're going to learn that whatever we do unto the Lord is an act of worship. We're going to learn about the whole spectrum. I want to see at least 400 out on our Sunday nights. Come on out. Every one of you need to be enriched by it. Most of us need it, and every one of us need to be enriched by it. Amen. Grab your children. Come on out. Let's be part of what God is doing. Let's produce disciples uh, that will go out and teach others and bring them to Christ. And then, of course, the greatest joy of the disciple maker is when they, when they have the moment to lead someone to the Lord and then walk alongside of them. Next week, we're going to, if the Lord tarries, we're going to look at three other facets of a vital, lively church. Oh, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you're saved this morning? Aren't you glad for the Word of God? Aren't you glad to be able to come to a house like this and, and worship the Lord? Aren't you glad that God and His wisdom blended 25 or 30 cultures together? And in this house, we are one. We get excited. We talk different languages. We have different culture backgrounds. We have different preferences. We have different view of things. But when we come into the house of God, we are one in purpose. And that is to worship the Lord and give Him praise and give Him glory. Amen. That's a unity that the devil can't defeat. Amen. That's a unity that the enemy cannot penetrate. That's a unity that God will use to bring people to the house of the Lord and into the kingdom work of God. I'm excited about it. Amen. I'm excited about penetrating our neighborhood. I'm excited about seeing you folk and me too continue to grow in the graces of God and in the understanding of God's word. I want to release from here at least three or four hundred preachers evangelists who will go into their homes and their neighborhoods, into their place of work and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just from knowledge but from what you've learned and what you've experienced in the presence of God. Amen. Oh, sing it again, guys, redeemed. Make the angels wonder one more time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Redeemed. Redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of I know I'm redeemed. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Redeemed to serve him. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. Amen. My rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence will be God continually dwell. Redeemed. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? You're saved, amen. Hallelujah. Redeemed. I know I'm redeemed. His child and forever I am. Hallelujah. 